I'm just going to talk about something that uh, occurred to me in the recent past. It's about six months ago. This word, which is a tongue twisting word, informationalization, uh, I didn't realize its meaning till very recently when I saw the whole new way of looking at things and the way it was defined. Uh, my presentation is into two parts. I'm going to talk about emerging market and bottom of the pyramid. And the second part, I'm going to redefine emerging market. And that's where we're talking about informationalization and innovation. Uh, I'm just going to make a quick review of what happened in the emerging market. Uh, as a word, it started appearing on the scene as early as 1980s, you know, not exactly 80s, but early part of 80s. But it actually became more popular much later in, and I think it's after 2000 that more and more people have started talking about the word emerging market. Uh, it has something to do with post opening up of the market we started in early 90s. Uh, Suddenly, we saw a lot of benefit of open market when we saw IT industry flourishing and bringing a lot of, uh, you know, uh, foreign exchange to India. It sort of established India as a global player. Uh, political thinking also supported globalization. And you all know about India's shining story, which was very popular in the early 2000. Uh, so India was officially labeled as emerging market around that time. There's another word which came into uh, a common conversation was BRIC countries. That's Brazil, Russia, India, and uh, China, but also now S is added South Africa. Uh, most of these are called as emerging market. And they're considered as a gold mine, and almost all the global companies want to want a piece of gold from these countries. Uh, let's look at definition of emerging market. Uh, the market, emerging market is considered as something that is waiting to grow and become matured. You know, the first two definitions deal with that. It's a transitional phase between a developing and a developed market. So there is something called a mature market, which happens to be a Western market, and you're supposed to uh, or aspire to go towards particular that. The third one is a slightly whimsical thing. It says countries where politics matters, at, at least as economics to the market. And this is where you sort of seeing another dimension of emerging market. Uh, early globalization was the, a shock to Indian industry and also a shock to Indian design community. Very soon we found that lots of foreign products were available in the market. In fact, most of the foreign brands were competing with each other and most of the Indian market uh, companies had wound up. So designer found his space quite constrained by the fact that there's a lot of things which are coming from abroad and people are buying it lap and up and he was sort of feeling quite restless as to what he should do. Uh, it's also uh, realizing that uh, emerging market is a very large market and it has a, now cloud. A lot of companies entered at this point and some of them, like Nokia, which won initially, but now it's not doing too well. Honda won initially. Uh, there are some who struggled, like Pepsi, Coca-Cola, Levi's, uh, Kellogg's, and, and some actually did a complete rethinking on our order to survive. It, at this point that people realized that emerging market is not exactly an undeveloped market which is waiting to develop. It has its own unpredictable kind of a character. It has its own different uh, ways of responding to products. Uh, it also created an interesting class system. This comes from Rama Bijakupur's uh, uh, wonderful book on uh, uh, We Are Like That Only. Uh, this is the way she has divided uh, the pyramid, the top one, the 3% which is about 6 million families, which is global sense drivers who are comfortable anywhere in the world. They almost live as if global citizens and they look for global qualities. And interesting part about is that they don't believe in value for money, they believe in money for value. And so they're ready to spend more money if they are ready to get good value out of it. The next class was consuming class, which is about 35%. And this was largely because of the resurgence of IT industry that this became a very lucrative market for most of the companies that came up, uh, uh, entered India. You know? That's because there was more disposable income. Then there was a choice of products which are available. There was a, a new shopping culture of going to malls all the time and trying to purchase something. 
This particular section believed for value for money. There was a, they also balanced benefit in prices. They were very careful buyers, and they would also try to make sure that they, what they're buying and they're getting the uh, uh, right product for the money that they spend. They also tried to balance westernization and tradition, and this became an ideal target for most of the global companies. Uh, Interesting is research shows that they are not influenced by branding or imagery at all. They are actually look at all this, but finally decide to buy very carefully by at least going three times to the shop and trying to purchase the kind of product that they're looking for. But this was an easy target purely because they were all basically in metros and you know you can have a marketing campaign which is directed towards them. So at this point, things were quite worrisome, you know, that almost everybody felt that uh, uh, foreign products are a threat to a culture that we will soon lose all of our Indian products and you know it will be dominated by what one calls as the McDonaldization of the world. Uh, so you'd see this being strongly advertised by a modern imagery of the kind of ornaments that people should wear. Lakshman didn't miss this at all when he said that Mahatma Gandhi Road had almost all the foreign products around him. So this was a phase of emerging market that we started off with. Uh, Indian companies also realized that there is a part of the gold, a piece of gold that they should have. So they started sort of uh, respecting design more. Lots more designers came into picture. They started designing products and you could see them sort of fighting back with the foreign companies. This is the first major fight back. Uh, things changed somewhere in mid 2000, that is around 2004. Uh, Two things happened at that time. One of them was there was uh, a focus on bottom of the pyramid, which came with a book by C.K. Prahlad on uh, fortune at the bottom of the pyramid. And at the same time, when the prime, new prime minister came at that time, Manmohan Singh, he actually announced that he wants a globalization with human face. So everybody started looking at what could happen to poor people, what could happen to the masses. Uh, so they were trying to, uh, government trying to balance new opportunities that globalization offers and the technologies that it can bring in with the benefits that go to the masses. Prahlad suddenly showed how though bottom of the pyramid and particularly last 60% actually consume 33% of the total GDP. You know? So that's a very large amount. And he said how uh, this could be converted into profit through its own uh, you know, approaches. But for design, and this was actually a kind of a godsend material, uh, a lot of design schools and a lot of design companies started looking at it as a resource for innovation. Uh, I'm just going to show you some which are uh, international responses and some which are national responses. It's not a collection of everything that is there, but it's just an example of some of them. For instance, uh, uh, Dr. Kawasaki, who is a Japanese designer, came out with an injection where you cannot use the needle again. You know, It's actually packed as an injection plus the, the uh, medicine. And once you open it, the needle is used and it breaks. So you cannot open it back again. This came from the fact that people tend to use the needles again, and it has a lot of uh, effect on health. Uh, this is an African example of uh, how to bring water home. Instead of carrying it overhead, you can sort of, it's called as a hippodrum. TU Delft came out with its own water purification system. It's a straw where you drink from any dirty water. It cleans up as you go on drinking. So there are some, some examples of these kinds, which are almost all, all design schools at one time were working on something for the bottom of the pyramid. And Africa and India were one of the places where they kept on visiting and sort of communicating. Uh, Indian design schools also tried to look at this as a cross-section for innovation. Uh, this was done by one student who felt that water is really scarce in villages, so and it's used for vessel washing and many other purposes, but can I save some water from vessel washing? So she came out with a mug which has got two leads uh, and two spouts, and depending on the amount by which you tilt, it gives you less and more water. Plus, of course, it has some interesting thing that it always floats with a handle up, so you can catch it without dipping your hand into water. So it's actually, it was designed mainly for cleaning of vessels. Uh, Indian school, uh, this was an interesting project. The student started with uh, the idea of designing a school furniture. He went and visited a lot of villages and found that the furniture there is very rickety, normally locally made and does not last. He also realized that uh, children have problems at uh, studying at home. 
And he came out with a very interesting uh, breakthrough idea, which is actually a school bag that gets converted into a school furniture. And as, uh, at home also, you can use it for studying. So it's a kind of a multipurpose device which does both. Uh, this is a time where the new word came, thinking frugal. And we cashed on it a little bit in the recent example of, uh, I, I teach game design. And we this year we decided that all the games will be designed only for poor people to be sold through hawkers in the train. So none of the games should be more than about 40 rupees. And it should be possible to sell it without any marketing. In fact, we want to put this on the web uh, for everybody to copy. We do not want to sell these games at all. So anybody who wants to take this game can download it. And it tells you how to make it. And it will be used by people. So we felt that there are two ways in which you can approach bottom of the pillar. One is to make it very frugal and also make it accessible to people. The next part, of course, was uh, can we design games? The next part would show you games where there is no hardware at all. Okay? They are still thinking games. They are still strategy games. These are the games which are played on playground by drawing something on the road or drawing something on the surface. And they are as challenging as the games that you can play on the board with lots of strategies involved. So student designed something with using maximum they used is a thermocol piece or a piece of uh, stone. But you could still play this game effectively. So, we were kind of focusing on frugal design, and this was just one example of uh, what we did. Industry also was trying to do something in this area. For instance, Godrej Chotukul is one example of doing something for uh, bottom of the pyramid, not exactly bottom of the pyramid, but slightly above it. They came out with this refrigerator, which is quite interesting. You know, it first is works on 12 volt battery. It is very small, it's about 40 liter capacity. It is gives you 20 degrees below the ambient temperature. There is no ice. In fact, they uh, two of their engineers spent two years in villages to try and understand what is the refrigeration need. And they realized that it's not ice that they need. They need to preserve milk. They need to preserve vegetables. So they came out with this idea, which, is, uh, which just meets the requirements. Uh, interesting part about it, they also knew servicing is very difficult, so that entire Electrical components are only in the lid. If there's anything wrong, you can just take a lid to the shop and get it repaired, and the rest of the thing remains at home. Uh, they had very interesting ways of delivering the product. They were a very interesting way of selling the product. I mean, they're not selling through market at all. They are SHGs, and they've got poems which are made which ladies sing and sell this kind of product. So it's a very interesting uh, kind of an approach. Not that it is very successful yet, but this is the first attempt to organize attempt to go to the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, there are others also which are there. For instance, uh, this is watch uh, water cooler, which does not require any uh, electricity nor uh, running water. This is based on nanotechnology combined with natural ingredients and gives you a one rupee per family per day is the cost of that particular uh, water. Now, there is a problem with dealing with the uh, bottom of the pyramid. First, and the conventional wisdom says that any decentralized market they're too expensive to address. First, they're difficult to research, they're difficult to measure, they're difficult to advertise, they're difficult to distribute, and service cost also is enormous. Okay, So on the face of it, you also don't see much of a business. So what do you do? Can you really address bottom of the pyramid? Uh, but people have made attempts. Chotukul was one. G is coming out with some interesting modular hybrid power generators which will be distributed all over so you can locally generate your power and if necessary you can put it also in the grid. So people are looking at how you can handle decentralized ways of work. So there is a possibility of converting these context into innovation opportunities in some small way. Industries have already done it. Design schools are already doing it. But to reach out to the potential market has always remained more of an academic exercise and a bit of exception to the rule by industries like Chotukul and you know, GE and some other efforts are also there. I'll show you some of them. Uh, so while design flourished during the globalization period in 2000, it was restricted mainly to the top of the pyramid or at least the upper part of the pyramid. Now, this is where I'm sort of taking to the second part is, would informationalization solve this problem? And this is where we go to the part two. I realized the potential of a new definition that was given by Center for Knowledge Societies, uh, trying to redefine what is emerging market. And I think it's a very interesting thing. Emerging markets are 
regions of the world that are experiencing rapid informationalization under the conditions of limited or partial industrialization. It took, I, I came across this quite early, but its real understanding of it came only a few months ago when I realized that this definition has, has more depth in it than what I had initially uh, sort of perceived. Uh, it simply means this, that information highways reached you before physical roads, that tablets might reach you before books and blackboards, internet and email can reach you before food and shelter, smartphone can reach you before post offices. Okay? Now, it's quite possible that you can take a view saying that, uh, you know, uh, it's a very lopsided development, this is an example of how things are going wrong. You can also say there are wrong priorities. And this is what most of the debate was in early 2000. There was, uh, you know, digital haves and digital have-nots. This has been a kind of well-debated kind of a market uh, thing. And it looked almost like a Hindi script of, uh, you know, one person poor and one person rich, and say they're far apart, but then they must marry together. Let's take sports, for instance. All that informa informationalization that has occurred in sports because of new technologies has created completely new experience. You are actually empowering yourself. You know, when you see something happens and is being replayed, you're almost trying to guess, is he out, is he not? And a lot of people have their opinions, he's out, and an umpire says he's not out. So there's a lot of participation that occurs uh, because of the fact that uh, there is informationalization of ideas. Uh, but what is different than a technology intervention and information? One is that need for information dictates technology and not the technology that dictates information. So this is a major shift that is very, very important. That can I take information as my basis for which I look for technologies? Uh, it, there can always be a critic of this, and which is a very valid kind of a criticism, that isn't it, isn't it too expensive? Is it restricted only to the top of the pyramid? And correct, it is to a certain extent right, but it's also wrong. Let's take an optimist view. Can you see this as an opportunity? Can you see this as new directions for future innovation, you know, for inclusive growth? And can you leapfrog? You know, this is something which uh, Sam Petroda was also talking about. Can you affect all sectors? Can you affect rural areas? Can you affect brick and mortar industries? And how does it change your conventional wisdom? Oh, this is a topic that I want to go to. Uh, exploring answers is also understanding key features of informationalization, which is not, which is nothing to do with it being expensive. In fact, that's not really what, it, uh, uh, what it really means. I'm not an expert in this, but I do want to project some of the views based on the things that I have seen and I've experienced. Uh, informationalization changes the rules of the game. And let's look at how it changes the conventional wisdom, uh, wisdom to a new wisdom. First, is uh, conventional wisdom, there is an economy of scale, economy of integration, economy of larger the better. You know, this is something which uh, we have been brought to sort of learn right from the beginning. You know, from, right from the time the mass production started, everybody said that you need everything to be large in order to become economical. Fair, that worked during certain time, but let's look at some ex simple example of this is that you cannot have a bank branch in a rural area at all if you think in terms of big because you'll never have that kind of business. So what do you do? You don't have a bank? bank banks had this kind of a problem before and they could not enter the rural area effectively and make business. Besides, banks had to fight with something which exists in the rural areas which is very in interesting. First is banks believe in government more than banks. Uh, uh, rural areas, men believe in government more than uh, banks. The reason is that they feel government will not cheat. So they would prefer to save in post offices rather than in bank. Then it's very simple that if the word state is there, they feel it's something to do with government. So State Bank of India has an advantage over Bank of India. Okay, They believe that that's a government bank Okay, and they're not going to cheat. Then there are local, local cooperative banks, which seem to be very, very effective because they talk their language, they deal with their kind of business, they understand their business better. There are also credit societies which work in this area. So how do you expect a big branch of a nationalized bank to enter these areas? Okay. Actually, people like A Little World and SBI converted this into an opportunity rather than seeing this as a problem. And they came out with something very simple and very effective. This is the device that uh, 
you have in the village. There is uh, electronic ID, there's a small printer, and there's a mobile phone, and there's a smart card. There's a lady, she's called as banking correspondent. She carries this material to a village, it goes at a given time. Uh, Everybody is given a smart card. They come, put this smart card into that uh, reader. They put their thumb uh, on that reader, biometric reader. And she also knows who the person is. So security problems don't come in. There is no question of literacy at all because there's very little thing that actually happens there. Everything is done on machine. And uh, it is so simple that this lady who is just about 10th or 12th standard uh, passed, she taught me how to do this in three minutes, okay? saying that this is the way to handle it. It's that simple. This process has reduced the training cost. Actually, the training for this lady is exactly five days, three days in a, a, a classroom and two days in the field. It has reduced the transaction cost to almost nominal, and it is possible to handle small amount. We stood there trying to look at what is happening, and people brought 15 rupees, 20 rupees, and 25 rupees to deposit. Now, a bank cannot accept this small amount because the transaction cost per, per transaction is very high. Now, even ATM, the per transaction cost is very high, so you cannot accept these kind of small amounts at all, but banks were forced to accept it, and that is the kind of problem that these guys have solved. And you know, accounts are updated because it's a mobile phone, you can get a connection, and you can update your accounts. Uh, the entire thing, including making of uh, uh, the smart card, is managed by women in the villages. And it is empowered women. It's also, through SHGs, it has done a lot of interesting work in most of these villages. Okay. So the point I'm making is that large is not required. A small plus small plus small can make it very big. And just imagine that 33% of India was not banking. That amount is huge. You know, just see how, how much the amount in the bank now, which is available for lending. Okay, so banks also have their commercial interest in getting that money into the banking system. Okay, so the point is that it does not cost much to handle small things, and that is the point that I'm making. And this rural banking is just an example. So the point that I'm making, first characteristic of informalization is that small is beautiful. Okay, this was extended to. Ruler hospitalization, okay? Uh, hospitalization cost has between 1995 and 2004. Uh, in urban areas, it is increased by 26%. In rural areas, it increased by 78%, which would mean that if in a rural area, if you're poor, if somebody falls in ill, there is, it's going to completely upset your savings and it upset your normal working. Somebody started, it's a very interesting idea. Somebody, he's a, he's a bureaucrat who started this scheme where everybody pays 30 rupees per person, okay, per year as a contribution to this particular uh, rural insurance scheme. Government puts another 450 rupees. And believe me, they have 60 million subscribers. So see the amount of money that's available to them right now, okay? And it is completely paperless. All that you do, everybody's given a card, you just swipe a card. So it's the same point that I'm making, that it's always small things can be a god of small, you know, it's like almost like a god. Same thing has happened in a sophisticated market. You know, for instance, in music, you don't have to buy a CD. You just, just buy one song. Okay? And it doesn't cost you more to buy one song anymore. High stores have shown how it can effectively serve population. Amazon extended this idea to expensive books, okay? It's extremely difficult to book, uh, print a book on architecture or design or some specialized topic because they don't know who, how many people are going to buy and you require a certain bulk in order to make uh, business. So they have come out to print by order kind of a, so if you order, they print one copy and give it to you and it's only marginally more expensive than a normal book because they've changed the printing technology to an extent that you can get a high quality book for a very small cost and only one will be printed because there's one order, there are 10, there are 10 orders. So the point that I'm making that small is not to be worried at all. This is something which we can live with without any difficulty. So the new wisdom is you can produce, you can buy and use as much as you need and it does not cost more to handle it at all. So small is still beautiful. Okay, the next one is conventional bidding. Inclusive growth is tough because the remote areas are difficult to access. They're difficult to reach. I mentioned that earlier to you. Uh, it's also difficult to sustain experts in that area. You know, for instance, it's very difficult to send teachers, it's difficult to send doctors, it's difficult to send engineers and all. This is a problem, but it's also an opportunity. GE came out with their 
ECG machine, which costs only 50,000 rupees now, and will come down further. It's one of the cheapest ECG machine, and no doctor is required to do it. It can be given to a paramedic, and the ECG can be sent, uh, uh, sent on a wire to a doctor. Okay? So entire telemedicine idea, the entire research that's going in telemedicine is based on the fact that distance need not matter. Okay. You can have a level of expertise that's available at rural areas, send that information to the city and get it processed. Can you informationalize education? It's already done in rich schools. You know, for instance, most international schools have highly informationalized educational system. They got video games, they got interactive whiteboards, they got sing-along softwares, they got internet-based things. Almost everything that uh, you uh, say, Bombay, at least Bombay and Delhi schools uh, already have it. The question is, can you go down the pyramid? And can you do it at a very low cost? This is what Khan did, right? Khan Academy is exactly doing that. You know? It's very cheap, very available. But more interesting is the experiment that IIT Chicago is doing using uh, some help from uh, Gates Foundation. Uh, they're using social media to get groups together to learn themselves. You just express your interest, become part of a member of that group, and sooner or later, one of them becomes a mentor and teaches the other one. Okay. And this is something which they're trying it on an experimental scale. Look at its effect. It would mean that uh, uh, tomorrow's teaching will completely be done on internet, but there will be other issues. Okay. If we extend this idea, we have Akash, and new, uh, new Akash was released only yesterday, which is much more powerful than that. Akash, YouTube together, can actually create something very, very different for school education. So students will visit school, but the schools will be very different in future. You would have a different form of school, a different form of teaching. So the new wisdom is remote is not remote anymore. It does not really create an issue. The distance is not a problem. The third wisdom is grouping of slab makes accounting simple. You know, this has been a conventional medium, so, uh, uh, it's a conventional way of thinking. For instance, we have stages in the bus, so you go, you're charged from one stage to another stage and not from stop to stop. You have same thing happening in the railways, you know, you start on the basis of stages. So the whole idea of stages, the whole system of railway booking can, and bus, bus booking will completely change. So to recap, informationalization defies common understanding. And some of the things that we establish as small is beautiful. You can produce, buy, and use what you need. A remote is not really a remote anymore. And pay for what you use. There are so many other things, but we need not go into that right away. There's, of course, a fallout of this that is happening, that when you informationalize, content is the king, which means that people like me who are doing product design, their services are incidental. Mobile phones are bought by service, and it comes bundled with that service. You know, so you either get a good mobile phone or a bad mobile. You don't have much of a choice. You know, pen drives will come with content. People will buy pen drives not for because it looks good, but because it has better content. Tablets also might be connected with some content or the other, so we may not have a choice at all. Uh, coming back to the design challenges for accepting informational informationalization. One is you need to search and develop technologies because you need certain kind of information. That information is going to help you save costs, save money, and also you know serve effectively. Uh, you also are able to, but you must deal with low literacy levels, and you'll also think of unusual applications. Now the question is: brick and mortar industries use informationalization. The question is which ones, how much, and with what effects. And there are very interesting examples of that. For instance. Can construction industry in rural area use informationalization? Can a company create a system of rural housing which are installed at very different kind of places all over and still informationalize? Uh, can rural sanitation be handled using that? There is nothing unique about it. Remote monitoring is not uncommon at all. The midday mill in UP is monitored by an IVR which auto-generates the call, and all that principal has to do is to just punch his number of the number of daily meals that are being sold, and all that gets onto a server, and monitoring is done far more effectively. As far as building industry is concerned, there are a lot of call centers in India who control sites in USA when the construction is going on. You know? They decide which material should go where, when, and all that, completely done in Bangalore. Okay. And there are a lot of uh, offer audio. It's possible to offer contextual audiovisual information to people who are constructing, you know, so that it become a lot easier. These are of course futuristic and somewhat spe speculative, but they're not impossible to achieve.
You can always criticize saying that, am I re just simply repackaging the idea of technology intervention? A lot of people say technology intervention solve problem. Uh, but I'm not completely kind of a believer in this because I'm asking a different question. You start your design with how do I informationalize an object or a system X and Y, and then search for technologies, and that gives you a very different answers than if you have a technology and you want to use it onto a product. So is it possible to revisit? Uh, it's, uh, it's now possible to look at uh, the entire issues of development which actually guided a lot of work in industry design during 70s, where he wanted to work in rural areas and actually did spend quite a lot of time there. Is it possible to revisit it through a different route? And that is possible. You can revisit the entire idea of development through this route. Is industry ready? And a better question to ask would be, are design schools and technology schools ready? For instance, this requires design and technology to come together. You cannot really have an independent and autonomous design schools which decide their own agenda. Thank you.